Hello, everyone, again. Welcome and thank you for joining uh, in our, for our RT21 web webinar today. Uh, my name is Chris, and I'm the channel manager at Apollo RT Technologies. Uh, today, we'll discuss real-time application in Australia, project overviews, trends, and perspective. And, and we have a, a great list of uh, specialists here to talk about us, uh, featuring Sorel uh, Grogon from uh, Osnet. He's a principal engineer over there. We have Behrouz Bahrani, who is the director of Grid Innovation Hub at Monash University. We have uh, Paul Moore, head of energy at Sage Automation. Uh, Felipe Arnio Vargas, who is a PhD candidate at UNSW. Uh, we have Deepak Kumar with us. Uh, he's a regional sales manager at Raymac and myself as a channel manager at Apollo RT Technologies. You can expect each speaker to have uh, the floor for about 15 minutes. Uh, we'll select uh, and answer some Q&A at the end of each session. So each time one of the specialists finishes a question, we'll have a question uh, for, the, for the specialist. If you have any question during the webinar, please type them into the chat window. Uh, we'll address them during the audience Q&A. There's also an audience Q&A uh, after all the presentation is done. Uh, we'll, address, uh, we'll also invite you to join for our networking launch where you can meet and interact with our speaker uh, and all the, also the uh, rest of the Australian uh, polarity community uh, that are uh, going to be invited to that uh, Wonder webpage. So we expect to see you there as well. So by the end of uh, our time today, we hope you feel more comfortable and confident about the importance of real-time simulation and how they will be helping solving problems of Austral uh, Australia, Australian grid of today and tomorrow. So I will uh, let Sorel start. Go ahead, Sorel. You can start sharing your screen. Sure thing. All right. Can I get you to uh, please release? Thank you. There we go. All right. I'm assuming everyone can see the screen, so I'll continue. Um, thank you, everyone. My name is Sorel Grogan. I'm an engineer here at uh, Osnet Services in uh, Victoria, Australia, and I'll be uh, taking us through uh, what I've titled Modelling a Sustainable Future. But it's um, I'd really like to think of this presentation uh, more as a, a problem statement about some of the challenges that we're experiencing as we uh, have an increased uptake in uh, inverter-based technology as the renewable energy uh, revolution uh, sweeps, up, sweeps over us. Um, in terms of what I'll be going through today, uh, I'll start off with a bit of an overview about who we are at Osnet Services, the energy revolution that is um, uh, happening, as well as how power system modelling is playing an incredibly important role and some of the solutions that need to be investigated to support, um, support power system modelling. So, who is Osnet Services? Uh, Osnet is a private company uh, that owns and operates a lot of the critical in energy infrastructure in Victoria, Australia. That's this little southeastern part of the mainland here. Um, we own and operate uh, all of the electricity transmission system, as well as a portion of the electricity distribution system and gas distribution system. Uh, this allows us to have unique insights from the uh, meters on people's houses right up to the uh, very high voltage equipment uh, across the state. Um, we're also very active in uh, trying to support the transition to uh, a renewable energy uh, future and are doing a, a lot of the uh, analysis and um, investigations that need to occur to support that. On to the uh, power system itself. So often in Australia, we like to consider that we have a 4D power system that's evolving. It's decarbonized, it's decentralized, it's digitized, and it's democratized. What these actually mean, uh, decarbonization is pretty self-explanatory. Um, certainly renewable energy technologies continues to be uh, the dominant technology that's being uh, connecting into the grid to provide uh, our generation requirements. And uh, this has largely been driven by very strong um, uh, carbon reduction targets um, at a state level, as well as um, the fact that, well, when, when you have a generation technology that has zero marginal cost, the economics tend to work out pretty well, especially as the new technology comes, uh, comes along. The system is also becoming decreasingly, uh, increasingly decentralized. Uh, this is not only uh, from a grid scale perspective, but also from um, a distribution perspective. On the grid scale side of things, we start to see a lot more generation connecting uh, in a very spread out area across the entire system. 
often in areas that have very great uh, wind and solar resources, but might not have the, um, the best transmission infrastructure resources. On a lower level, and I'll talk to this a little bit later as well, uh, solar PV uh, continues to roll out at uh, very, very large levels. Uh, so much so that um, there's roughly, I think about 23 gigawatts peak demand for the East Coast uh, system. We see in excess of four gigawatts of that uh, generation um, being delivered by rooftop solar PV, that is residential solar PV. So um, it's really quite decentralized and it's, uh, it's really great to see. Um, it throws some technical challenges our way as well. The system is also very much digitized um, first of all from a grid interface perspective so rather than um, magnetic energy uh, transfer with a lot of the uh, synchronous machines of old we see a lot more inverters being deployed now and inverters will need to be programmed to operate a certain way so that means that the algorithms behind all of that are very digital in nature and that uh, makes it quite more uh, challenging to understand how those devices are going to behave under all different uh, scenarios. It's not only the uh, energy interface that's becoming digitized but also the market mechanisms behind them as well. So we now have multiple uh, providers of energy in the um, Australian power system that uh, dispatch and make market decisions based purely on AI technology. That is, there's no trader sitting behind there pressing buttons. It's actually done by AI uh, bidding the systems into the market. So digitization is sweeping across every facet of our um, energy system. And as mentioned earlier with rooftop solar PV, energy is becoming democratized with um, uh, solar PV being uh, the, the largest generator. Rooftop solar PV on residential um, houses is um, meaning that during the day, we often have negative demand and that causes prices to absolutely plummet as well. And that puts a lot more power back into the consumer's hands. So the consumers are generating own, their own energy and that's uh, really shaking things up in way in all forms of uh, the uh, traditional models that uh, used to be used for running the, the power system. And additionally, it's becoming much more um, financially viable for a lot of people to simply go off grid. Um, why connect to the grid when I can generate it myself, right? So we're seeing a very strong uh, democratization of the power system. To really hammer home the point of the scale of um, the, the amount of uh, change that we're seeing in the system. I've got the next two slides here. So first of all, uh, this slide here shows the new technology that is um, attempting to connect online into the Victorian system. So each one of these icons here has a number next to it. That's the number of megawatts that wants to connect into um, our system. And any, uh, any one of the generation icons that's not blue, that is a new technology or sorry, a new uh, provider that wants to connect into the system here. Now you can see here that we've got a huge amount of solar interest, um, especially in the Northern part of the state, um, some wind interest as well, but we were also starting to see a lot more uh, battery technology being deployed across the state around some of the load centers. So we're seeing a huge change in the, in the uh, generation fleet where previously it used to be all uh, clustered in this little center down here. Now it's spread throughout the state and in uh, truly staggering uh, amounts as well. So that's uh, keeping us all very busy in the Australian industry. The second figure I wanna show you about uh, the pace of change that we're talking about here is uh, what's on screen. Uh, on the left we've got is uh, for the financial year 2018-2019, um, the level of system strength that was present across Victoria. And I'm sure we'll be uh, talking about this in some of the other presentations as well. Um, in 2018-2019, things were looking reasonably all right, except for this loop here that um, had some system strength issues due to large amounts of grid following uh, inverters connecting online, but um, not a lot of uh, grid support there. But within the space of one year, we start to see a dramatic change um, in the picture of what it looks like in Victoria. So system strength is, that is, I should say more generally, the, um, the integrity of the voltage waveform under all circumstances is starting to see uh, rapid degradation. Um, and so what we have at the moment is uh, people trying to deploy synchronous condensers, grid forming batteries, and any other form of uh, system strength bolstering solutions as quickly as possible. 
So this means all in all that um, our system is evolving at a rapid rate. Now, to be able to understand what all of this new technology means, we need to model the system in a lot more detail than we ever have uh, we ever have had needed to do before. That's where um, ENT modeling really comes into the fore. Uh, what this slide is uh, showing showing here is that, well, quite simply, the traditional RMS models that we typically use to be able to un understand the uh, transient stability phenomena of the of the NEM are starting to fail in certain scenarios. And those certain scenarios tend to be where there's a lot of renewable, uh, sorry, that's probably not the right term, I would say inverter-based technology connecting into the grid in one particular area. What we start to see between the two different types of models being root mean square and electromagnetic transient is that the RMS models tend to overestimate how well things are going to go. Um, there could be a fault on the system. The RMS model will say, yeah, you'll be right. Don't worry about it. Whilst the EMT model says, well, actually, you're in for a complete system collapse. And what we've, we've actually started to see uh, a much greater uh, congruence between the EMT modeling results and the infield measurements. So what this means essentially is that the industry is increasingly have we have to shift to EMT models when we need to do stability and uh, transient stability analysis uh, in inverter dominated systems. Um, to that case in point, this example on the right here shows a uh, area of the system that had a large amount of um, solar generators concentrated together, and uh, we noticed in the actual system there was uh, these kind of a uh, a strange term, but steady state oscillations, but persistent, uh, but not growing oscillations in the system. When we started doing analysis, we saw that the RMS model said, no, nope, you should be fine. It just goes back to perfect steady state. But the EMT model analysis showed that there was actually a stability issue here. And that's because these EMT models many times actually contain the real source code that's out there in the field, in the inverters in the field, just compiled up and plonked inside the EMT models. So these EMT models, unlike the RMS models, are able to give us a better understanding about how the control systems in these inverters are going to behave in reality, and importantly, how they're going to interact with one another in high concentration areas. This is causing uh, quite a challenge when it comes to trying to connect new generators uh, onto the system. Um, essentially, for each new generator that wants to connect in, they need to do analysis and show, right, how am I going to design my system such that I keep the system in a secure state under all conceivable scenarios. Now, to be able to do that, it's very reasonable for a person to say, okay, so if I need to know how I'm going to respond in the system, I need a copy of the, of the models of the system, right? I need to understand what's happening out there, but we can't actually do that. And that's because these EMT models contain so much confidential information. They actually, in, as I said earlier, uh, often contain the actual source code compiled up inside the um, EMT model that the manufacturers, understandably so, are unwilling to share that um, more broadly because there are there's years, if not decades worth of intellectual property that is, could be contained within a single model. Now, if that model were to fall into the wrong hands, is it possible for it to be reverse engineered and intellectual property to be uh, to be stolen? It's not a zero possibility, right? So there's a very strong um, uh, need to understand the intellectual property concerns of the various manufacturers, but that doesn't help us connect new generation. Um, effectively, the new generators are uh, met with a problem of, well, how on earth do you expect me to tune and find out what's happening in the system if I'm not allowed to get the information that I need to be able to do that. So this model sharing uh, paradox is a very real problem in our system at the, at the moment. And what it's meant is that um, the burden of actually assessing new generator connections and in some cases even designing some aspects of that uh, generator connection is now uh, lying with the people who are allowed to get a copy of all the models. And that tends to be the independent system operator in Australia's case, that is AEMO and various different network operators. So this uh, is fast becoming a choke point, slowing down um, the, uh, the connection of new renewable uh, technology. And we can completely understand the frustration of many people in the industry who want to connect, but are just hit with delay after delay after delay because of the modeling issue. So we need to start to look at different uh, potential solutions. The first one that comes to mind is black box modeling. And this is certainly something that's been discussed uh, at length, where if you take a black box model, compile it, encrypt it, or otherwise obfuscate all of the sensitive information into a model, then theoretically, 
you should be able to share this um, more broadly across the industry. And we should be able to share it as readily as we share our existing RMS dynamic models. This means that people can work in parallel. We can verify and check each other's work to make sure we've got the right solution. And the workload is spread across the entire industry. But this also causes a couple of challenges. Um, First and foremost, there are still residual uh, concerns that remain uh, from manufacturers about whether you could brute force reverse engineer. Like if you if you have a black box model at the connection point, could you just throw enough faults at it, enough um, weird scenarios at it that you can actually extract out what algorithms and tricks they're using in their uh, turbines or inverters to, um, uh, to see what their competitive edge is. Additionally, there's a question of trust. Um, if a model is fully black box such that you can barely see anything, how do we know it's really a model of the plant? And there's been at least one instance where um, this has actually happened, where someone submitted a model that was, um, well, quite simply, overly optimistic to what the plant could be uh, could be done, and it was all obfuscated behind the um, the black box model. And of course, it introduces uh, more model uh, management challenges. Perhaps that one's not such a, a big issue. There's another solution that we can look at, and that's the use of shared modeling platforms. The idea um, here is that we have a singular centralized uh, simulation platform man managed by a trusted party. The trusted party sets it up in such a way that there is uh, all of the wide area and all of the confidential models from all of the different manufacturers sitting in a secure zone within the simulator. Now, connecting to that, is a, uh, a point of connection model where somebody brings in their own wind farm or solar farm or battery, they hook it up to the confidential model, they're using the confidential model, but they don't have a copy of the confidential model. That's a very important distinction. In that way, um, a, new, a new participant can use this information to properly tune their plant and uh, understand what's happening um, uh, how their plant affects the broader system. This is still not free from challenges. Um, obviously, this still means that the model management remains the burden of that trusted party, of that centralised party in Australia, most likely to be AEMO. And it's still not fully transparent to the end user. That means that the end user might be frustrated, like, oh, how come when I hook in my solar farm, Bob's wind farm down the road suddenly trips offline. Um, you know, that, that kind of information is still not necessarily fully transparent. It's also not something you can buy off the shelf. And I'm sure if we haven't heard it already, we'll be hearing more about this because I know Opal RT are very heavily involved here. Um, but there, this service is something that needs to be created. It, it's something that, um, at least in the first few instances, is likely to be bespoke. And it does need a huge amount of compute power. So if you can imagine that you might need say 64 cores to run a wide area model of the east coast of Australia. If there's 200 people who want to use it at the same time, I um, hope you've got a lot of computing power uh, available because it, it's going to require a lot of different um, uh, systems. So we, we, need, we need to have flexibility in that space there. Now, the final thing I wanna mention um, about a, an important, I guess you could call it a solution, but let, let's just say a necessity for the industry are skill sets. Um, oftentimes, with uh, many of the people uh, that I work with in uh, various different organisations, we often say, well, you know, 50% of the time, yeah, we're dealing with power system problems, but the other 50% of the time, we're dealing with computer science problems that are IT problems, uh, coding, uh, understanding hardware infrastructure, understanding the way that compilers work, those kinds of things. So it is increasingly important um, for people in this industry, not only to be familiar with uh, traditional power systems, uh, more novel control system technology, uh, more novel inverter technology, which I'm sure Beruz will be uh, talking about very soon, but also understanding uh, a lot of the computer science uh, aspects of it as well, and being very strong, not only in those two areas, but communication skills. As, as we um, have a system that is evolving at such a rapid pace, lessons learned are crucial. People need to be able to um, you know, exchange information, exchange learnings with one another in, very rapidly so that we can actually meet this challenge of being able to transition our power system to be non, uh, well, to yeah, effectively be zero carbon as soon as humanly possible. So that's really important. And um, if there's anyone who's um, at university listening in on this, I really strongly you to focus, really strongly encourage you to focus um, on these areas as well. It will serve you very well if you want to be in the power system industry. 
So to summarize the top five um, things I'd like you to take away from uh, my presentation is that renewable generation continues uh, to connect and it will only accelerate. Um, and a lot of that renewable uh, generation brings with it inverter-based resource technology. And that inverter-based uh, technology is starting to throw some interesting challenges for the industry to solve. And as far as we can tell, EMT-based modelling is the only way that we're going to be able to understand a lot of the transient stability phenomena that is uh, starting to occur in high um, uh, penetration areas of inverter-based technology. To be able to solve all of this, though, we really do need to be able to share information more widely. So if, if, um, if there's a solution to solve um, the information sharing paradox, it will be extremely welcome. And we hope that we see some, uh, some changes there soon and that um, our workforce as well needs to keep up with the change in technology because things are changing at a phenomenal pace. So that concludes my presentation. I'm now gonna hand back to Chris. Thank you so much, Sorrel. I think you have addressed very well some of the issues that Australia is facing today. Uh, I will take one question from the Q&A section to have you answer directly to you. So one question for you is, uh, uh, different utilities in the world use different simulation tool nowadays. This seems to be a real challenge for manufacturers as well as service provider and production owners. To your point of view, how could the community of or software developer contribute to a better standardization? Oh, that is <laughs> that is a that is a huge and brilliant question. Um, so, I think look um, the, the short the short answer is is um, getting involved in a lot of the the standards community so i certainly know that um c gray is looking at um the question of trying to uh if not completely standardize es essentially trying to define common apis um for inverter based technologies in um emt based model uh platforms uh, i'm not sure if that's being done in the rms space as well but um there there are there are some organizations that are looking at that but um when it, when it comes to uh, this, the software engineering side, I don't know. I, I, I often think that, um, if I'm quite frank, I, I often think that uh, power systems engineers like to think they know everything, but the frank, the, the frank uh, issue is, is that they don't. And they need, they need to understand that um, power systems now is not just all um, the old stability criterion. It is actually about good coding technology. And maybe if we could share that information across those different streams, um, you know, really trying to get um, uh, power systems engineers uh, cross-skilled with a strong computer science technology, we might see that um, not only we can uh, better standardize a lot of the way that models are written, uh, improve their stability and improve algorithms as well. Um, we, we may actually just uh, solve a lot of the, um, the confidentiality issues as well, because there's, there's so many confidentiality and uh, computer science, I think you know, they go hand in hand um, in terms of the, um, the, the research stream. So yeah, it's, it, it's a really tough question. I don't have a singular answer other than please get involved in uh, the working groups that are looking at um, modeling standardization. I think that's a good answer. Thank you. Thank you, Sheryl. And there's other questions. We'll address it in the audience Q&A. So keep them coming. So we'll address them when the time is there. So now uh, on to our next presenters, none other than Dr. Behrouz Bahrani from Monash University, who will be speaking about real-time simulation for grid integration of renewable energy resources. Uh, so Dr. Behrani is a director of Grid Innovation Hub and a senior lecturer at Monash University. He got his PhD from École Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne, and uh, he had his uh, master's from university not far from here in Montreal, from University of Toronto. It's on to you, Berus. Take, take it away. Yep. Thank you so much, Chris, and thanks for the introduction. I, so hopefully I can wrap this presentation up in 15 minutes. Um, um, so unlike Sorel, who talked about uh, well, a, well, he painted a very good picture of the situation in Australia. I will be talking a little bit more about technical um, aspects of grid integration of renewables that I want to um, talk about what we do at Monash about grid integration of renewables and uh, two of the projects that are also very well related to OPRT and uh, real-time simulation. Uh, okay, great, it's working. I, 
So before I jump into that, a very uh, quick introduction on this, but I guess Sorel uh, talked about this much better than I would be doing here. This is uh, the Australian power grid, at least the uh, NEM part, National Electricity Market. And these dots here are representing a uh, system strength. So well, of course, the greener it is, uh, the better system strength is. And what is system strength? Well, it determines how reliably your power system can operate up on different contingencies. So if you've got a fault or something, how well you can recover from the fault. Well, of course, when you've got very low system strength, it is difficult to uh, recover after a fault and your farm might actually uh, get disconnected. And as projected by AMOS ISP, the situation can be even worse in 2029. We've got, uh, we can see more red dots in the map and, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's going to be even worse in 2039. So as we move forward, uh, it's going to be worse and worse. So we need to do something. But why is it so bad? Because when you look at the renewable energy zones, most of them are actually overlapping these red dots. And that means that we cannot comfortably and reliably uh, integrate more renewables. So we need to do something about that. But how can we actually maintain a stable grid? There are certain uh, pillars here in, a, in order to maintain stability in your grid and system strength is one of them voltage control frequency control and inertia these are all four pillars that you have to have for your stable grid and there are different uh, you know uh, equipment that would deliver this for you and of course synchronous generator used to deliver all of these for us but with retiring synchronous generators we need to have more uh, you know, uh, innovative ways of providing these services. And grid forming inverters in particular are one of the most uh, promising assets and equipments in the, in the grid, which potentially can provide all of these services for us in the future. Also, of course, synchronous condensers are becoming, uh, again, gaining some uh, popularity in the grid, but I believe that uh, inverter-based technologies and IBRs um, are the way to go. At Monash, what we do, we focus on various technologies around IVRs, around grid integration of renewable energies. And in particular, we are following, uh, we're actually uh, looking at two uh, types of inverters, one grid following inverters, um, and one is grid forming. Well, a very brief introduction on what is actually a grid forming and grid following. So a grid following inverter, it needs the point of connection voltage because it then feeds the point of connection voltage into a PLL, a phase lock loop, in order to extract the phase angle of the, PL, uh, of the POC voltage in order to control the current and power into the grid. And typically, uh, the PLL that we are having here is a source of instability in weak grids. And that's actually one of the challenges we've got at the moment in certain regions in the NEM where the system strength is not high. So it's not easy to maintain a stability there and it, the system can be prone to instability upon contingencies or even uh, in normal operation, you might see certain oscillations, subsynchronous oscillations um, in, the, in the grid, mainly due to these uh, PLLs. On the other hand, grid forming technology, which is a newer technology and it is becoming more popular and more prevalent at the moment in the grid, doesn't rely on PLL. It actually is kind of, power synchronized rather than uh, synchronized with PLL. So what it does, it actually controls the point of connection voltage. And by controlling this point of connection voltage can exchange power with the grid. And there is a primary control loop here that provides the uh, data for you, uh, which is in contrast to the PLL that we had for grid, for, uh, grid following inverters. Because we don't have this PLL, it can perform much better uh, in very, very weak grids. Well, it also has its own challenges, of course, uh, if your grid is extremely strong, then controlling the voltage at the point of connection is not easy. But in Australia, typically the problem is the other way around. Typically, we've got uh, weaker grids and having a grid forming inverter is actually the way to go. Very briefly on what that primary loop is, the primary loop that we've got for grid forming uh, typically is based on droop control or virtual synchronous generator controls. These are two main types um, that uh, we have for that primary loop. At the end of the day, you can argue that droop control and VSG are essentially the same thing. So um, it, it can be proved that they are essentially um, different types of the same um, solution. Uh, but VSG is, is uh, of course, more attractive at the moment in industry. And uh, very recently, we published a review paper if you're more interested to, if you're interested to know more about uh, grid forming inverters and how they operate, you can refer to that grid um, forming review paper. It reviews the technology around Droop and VSG. 
So what we are doing at Monash, we are trying to provide better solutions for grid forming control. So uh, a few of the recent works we've done, but these are not yet uh, publicly available. We are hoping that they will be uh, published very soon in the next coming month, in the next two, three months, hopefully. Uh, but very briefly, if I want to uh, discuss what they are, uh, we have been working on the active power control um, loop. If I go back actually to here, so every VSG has a, a reactive power control and active power control loop. So we've been working on the active power control loop to provide better control compared to the existing group and VSG. So we have identified the model of uh, the uh, grid forming controller and based on uh, some sophisticated, I would say, uh, approaches to design the controller. We have come up with a controller which can provide better performance upon contingencies. And in particular, what I mean is that uh, when we are having a load change or when we are having a set point change for our grid forming inverters in, in, in the grid connected mode at the left hand side, you can see that droop control and VSG, well, VSG can provide a can actually result in certain oscillations, which are not very good. But what we have designed, the H Infinity one that we have designed, it can actually very, uh, very well track the reference without any extra oscillations. And when you're comparing the uh, the performance in the I landed mode, our controller can provide a better performance in terms of Rokoff uh, constraint because one problem that you've got in the I landed mode is that how fast is, uh, how bad actually is your Rokoff? So you need to have a good Rokoff which is compliant with grid codes. And Droop is probably, well, is the worst. It doesn't uh, give you any inertia and it can be actually very uh, fast in terms of change in the frequency, meaning that you have a very high Rokoff, which is not good, but, but VSG can give you better uh, Rokoff and what we have designed is even better. So it has less oscillations in grid connected mode and better Rokoff compliance in, in the islanded mode of operation. We are hoping that this will be um, published very soon and there is a subsequent work that we have done on this. Uh, again, that's under review. Hopefully that one will be also out very soon, which gives a very nice generalized approach for controlling VSG and, and tuning VSG uh, in, in a way that you can get a, any performance that you want based on the um, constraints that you've got in terms of Rokoff and rise time. Stay tuned for those papers. Uh, hopefully uh, very soon you'll see them. We have tried to experimentally validate these so far. And of course the experimental validation works very, very well uh, so far. But what we are hoping to do is to go beyond a SMIP case. What you're seeing here is a SMIP case, single machine infant bus case uh, for our system. And it works very well, but what we are hoping to do, we are hoping to actually, instead of connecting it to an infinite bus, connect it connecting the uh, converter to a real-time simulator or RT simulator via a Regatron uh, amplifier. And we're hoping to have a real-time simulated system, maybe starting with a IEEE 39 bot system in uh, Opal RT and connecting the inverter to that to see how the system operates in a larger system, not only looking at it at, uh, with, a, with a SMIP case, which is very uh, interesting study. This is currently on the way. And we're hoping that we can do it uh, in the next month or so. The second uh, project I wanted to very briefly talk about, which also is using Opal RT technologies and uh, Opal RT simulators, is frequency control in low inertia power systems. And the idea of this uh, this study was to see how we can use a uh, fast acting battery energy storage systems to st stabilize the frequency. And the idea is not using grid forming here. The idea is to use grid following inverters, but to see how we can use batteries in order to provide better performance. Because at the moment, batteries are actually uh, using their local information and that local information is only used in a droop controller in order to inject power when there is a contingency in the system. So the idea is to use uh, wide area monitoring systems with uh, PMU. I think we lost uh, Berus. Sorry, my microphone just okay. got disconnected. <laughs> yes. No worries, buddy. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, the idea is to use PMUs in order to uh, have actually a better control compared to a uh, droop control. So what we have done, we have simulated the uh, NEM 
actually, uh, well, a, a more simplified version of the name, and I'll show it uh, in a minute, uh, in, in OPALRT, and we have tried to identify the model at the point of connection of each of the batteries, and we have designed a controller which can outperform a droop control. So the idea is to use the battery energy storage system to excite the system, and using PMUs, we will uh, monitor the information in the system and come up with a we will identify the system from the point of connection and use the identified model in order to to design a better controller and finally we use the uh, pmu data in order to feedback signals to control the frequency at each battery so this is the system that we have um, simulated in opal rt so uh, this um, has been uh, actually done uh, last year and we are still working on it to make it uh, more uh, comprehensive and add more features to this. But in a nutshell, this, uh, this actually simulates the Southeastern Power System of Australia. We've augmented that with some more uh, renewable energy sources and we have used uh, coal and hydro turbines that have synchronous power plants. And we have actually used AMO 16 zone uh, National Transmission Network Development Plan uh, for the locations. And we have put four battery energy storage systems in each region in this uh, system. And then we have connected a PMU to each point of common coupling. Um, I'm not gonna go through the details of the wide area monitoring system that we've used here, but in a nutshell, again, a PMU is connected to each battery. And these PMUs, the local data is, uh, they're aggregated by an upstream uh, PMU data concentrator, and we have used OpenPDC for that. And then the data streaming is done by, uh, over Ethernet for us. And we, we get the data and we, well, here you can see the, uh, the PMU that we have connected here. And some of the PMUs are simulated in our Opal RT, but we have got also PMUs, which are actual PMUs. So this is some sort of hardware in the loop test bit. So we don't have any inverter or anything. The whole system is within Opal RT, but the PMUs are outside, meaning that the hardware that we've got in the loop is actually the PMU. So the PMUs are interacting with uh, the Opal RT and giving data to Opal RT. Uh, so it's essentially PMU in the loop, if you want to call it. So the actual PMU are uh, from PSL. Uh, so we have used a, a cell 2488 satellite synchronized master clock for the PMUs and again open PDC and we have implemented this VAM communication network in order to do the identification of the model and then uh, doing also the actual control using the PMUs. So I've got some very um, well brief results here to show. This is the model that we have uh, identified using the PMU. So essentially this is the model of the battery energy storage system from the point of connection identified by, uh, essentially this is the model between power, active power and frequency and identified at the point of connection of each battery energy storage system. And we have actually uh, designed a controller which the idea is to outperform a simple droop control. So very briefly, uh, the results here, you can see that the frequency trajectory up on a load change. So I've got with no control, with dro droop control 3%, which is the state of the art for most batteries and the controller that we've put in place. So it actually can, can uh, arrest uh, the frequency and the nadir here is uh, better than what you would have with without a control, of course, and also with a uh, droop control. Um, and here are some more uh, tests that shows that uh, with, with, without any controller, with droop and without edge infinity, typically the uh, frequency excursion is more limited. So it means that with the same battery, we are capable of uh, having better frequency control if we go for this uh, uh, mechanism. So these are actually the uh, two projects that we are currently having with Opal RT, but we are hoping to expand in particular as soon as we can have that hardware in the loop uh, control for the IBR that we are putting together with Regatron and Opal RT that will open a lot of doors for us and hopefully we can do a lot of studies and we can have a larger system, not only IEEE 39 bus. The idea is to have uh, if we can, the uh, whole um, West Mara region uh, in that Opal RT system. And the idea is hopefully to use HyperSim uh, in order to model that and connect inverters to that area if we can. But of course, yeah, but there are uh, limitations for the inverter that we've got. Uh, but the idea is to uh, also focus on HyperSim. Uh, 
and hopefully develop the model for uh, the Western um, Victoria in order to do a studies because well, that's an area that has a lot of problems as Sorel paints the picture and we're hoping to do more studies there. Thank you so much, Chris. That's great, Sorel. Um, sorry, Berus, it was, was great. Uh, it was great yeah. being involved with you from the beginning as well. So I know where this yeah. started and I know where this yes. is going. So yeah. it's great to see the, uh, the progress that you guys did in Monash. Yeah. Really proud of it. Good job. Guys. Yeah. Thank you uh, so much. So I'm going to take one question from the audience. So this is for Behrouz. Yes. Uh, it seems like grid forming inverters offer all the necessary functionalities to ensure stable grid interconnection. When will grid following inverters be useful to your point of view? I, so you mean that, uh, let me make sure if I understand the question. Yes, grid forming inverters, they have all of the functionalities, of course, but at the same time, you don't want to have every single inverter uh, as grid following, sorry, grid forming, because most of the time your farms, they're supposed to only work at the maximum power point. So most of the, the, the farms, at least at the moment, those who do not have a battery energy storage system would still be operating with the grid following inverter. Um, and well, we do have a lot of batteries which are coming along and most of them these days are becoming uh, grid forming. So my view is that what's going to happen in future is that most of the batteries, and we are having a lot of them actually currently being either installed or installed or will be installed in the next uh, couple of years, I, I, I believe that most of them will be uh, grid, grid forming inverters. They will provide system strength for us. And then the rest of the system would still operate at the grid following uh, mode. So this is my view. And, I, and at the same time, uh, there is another thing that one can do. Um, and that, that of course depends on OEMs and how they want to, uh, to proceed. But still you can have uh, certain changes in your grid following inverters in order to, um, in order to actually make them somehow similar to grid forming without having any inertial support, without having any, any uh, primary loops, you can have the controller that doesn't require a PLL, which is power synchronized and only injects the real and reactive power that you want. And that is also useful because it won't require any PLL, which is problematic in weak grid. So my view is that in future, we will have um, a combination of grid forming and grid following. Uh, of course, the legacy ones will probably remain grid following because it's difficult to change to change them. Probably they will stay the same, but most of the future installations will be grid forming. Any battery that we'll be putting in the grid will be grid forming. And the future farms potentially could be a combination of grid forming and following. And I, I know that there are certain farms which are putting battery energy storage system next to the farm in order to provide uh, grid forming technology as well. So it will be a mixture. Uh, and it's very interesting to see how it actually evolves. Um, but so, I guess, yes, grid forming will play a big role. Great, great answer. So uh, I have a surprise because Jean is, uh, has his hands raised. So let me allow him to talk. So let's, let's see what happens. Jean, go ahead. Unmute yourself, Jean. You have to unmute yourself, Jean, to talk. Uh, oh, okay. We'll give him a few four seconds. Now we'll move on to the next presentation. Okay, Jean. Okay. Okay, Jean. You can wait for the. Uh, oh, here you go. He's good. Go ahead, Jean. It was very good the presentation. I just uh, I was in my car, so. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> it, is, uh, it is it is amazing. Uh, but uh, can we say uh, where is your where is your uh, colleague still there? Yeah, they're there. Go ahead. So can we can we say that the grid forming tries to emulate the fitness machine? Well, grid forming inverters there. Well, most of the grid forming inverters that have been installed in the grid currently, they are trying to uh, precisely. Uh, model or simulate or a, a, a synchronous machine, okay. which I don't think is the best thing actually, uh, to be very frank, uh, because you know, what we are trying to do with that, we are trying to, to actually force a piece of equipment, which is extremely 
um, you know, flexible yeah. to, to make it actually re behave exactly like a synchronous machine, which has certain limitations. So I don't see uh, why we cannot go beyond that. We can actually have a grid forming inverter, which can be even better than a synchronous machine. But for the moment, and I guess it will probably be the, uh, the case for the next couple of years, yeah. all of the installations in the grid, they've been exactly such that they've tried to exactly mimic a synchronous generator. But I believe there is a lot more than we can do with a grid forming, with, with an inverter in general. It doesn't have to exactly mimic a synchronous generator. And this is actually one of the topics that we're working on um, um, at Monash to, to see what else can a grid forming inverter do for you? Why should it only and only give you a synchronous generator uh, behavior? It could be better than a synchronous generator. But maybe it is much better than having a, having a PLL or, or with a React harmonic and all that. Yes. <laughs> Oh, the problem. So this is a very, very nice subject. Yep. So thank you for using our our system. Yes. No. That, well, thank you so much for making it available. <laughs> thank you. Good. Yep. Uh, Chris, you're on mute, I guess. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so drive safe, Jean. So let's move on to our next uh, speaker, uh, Paul Moore. Uh, Paul Moore is the head of energy at Sage Automation. So before working at Sage, Paul had few technical commercial role at Rockwell Automation, ONG Automation, and Hanley Automation. Uh, so go ahead, Paul, go ahead. Thanks, Chris. Uh, hopefully everyone can see that now. Um, yeah, as, as Chris says, uh, my name is Paul Moore, I'm head of energy at Sage. Uh, we're primarily a systems integration business. So if you're here to see me present uh, really cool EMT plots and do deep analysis of oscillations on the grid and things like that, you're not gonna see that uh, in this presentation at least. Um, but what I am gonna talk about is, um, I'm just gonna give you an overview of the business that we are and what we actually do and what we're doing in the energy space. And a lot of it speaks a little bit to Sorrell's um, points of, you know, we're primarily a control systems company, a lot of computer science and data science within our business as well. And we see that as being the future. So a lot of what we're doing is, is focused in that area. I'm gonna cover some of the projects that we are actually doing at the moment, and then um, get you to the point of what we see as the challenges for a business like ours within those projects, particularly microgrid type projects. And then um, talk you through, you know, our re recent acquisition of a 4510 unit um for for some testing and what we're planning on doing with that and give you then a little bit of an overview of a program that we're doing with the university of adelaide to construct a microgrid simulation rig for our own internal use and and for other uses so with that um i'll just give you a quick overview of our business um control systems integration is is the core of the business we also have data sciences uh, business sister company called newcom um, we have the pleasure of working, we, we see that we're vendor independent, we have to make many, many different systems work, many different communication protocols, many different devices from different vendors all talk together to produce a system that works. And in a microgrid context, that's, that's no different for us. Um, this is an overview of the business structure. So I work in the Sage Automation Group, which is primarily control and automation projects, uh, power systems integration and so on. But um, like I mentioned briefly, we do have a sister company called Newcon who are on the data science, computer science side of things. Um, we also have a skills lab business, which is a registered training organization. And we also do provide embedded expertise. Um, so I'll just give you a bit of an overview of, this is the sort of suite of solutions and what we do. Um, so we specialize in microgrids and microgrids, I think is an interesting topic because it's becoming harder and harder to find what a microgrid actually is. Uh, there's so many subcategories within that space, be they remote microgrids, embedded networks, uh, fringe grid networks, all, all of these sorts of things. Um, we work in the industrial space and we're seeing an increasing influx of large scale behind the meter at a, our industrial customer base as well. So we have some large solar systems that are 30 megawatt plus um, sitting in a, in a behind the meter configuration. Uh, which we're controlling. A lot of standalone systems. Um, we do see um, rapid digitization of the transmission and distribution networks, which we're providing some services in that space around, particularly around communications and things. 
Um, and then a whole suite of, of other sort of related services. So that's broadly speaking, the types of things that we get involved in. Um, we're also doing a little bit in the space of um, product development. So we've got our own uh, edge device um, and we see uh, a large future for that in the sort of smart energy communication space. So what we're illustrating here is um, sort of the grid of the future where we've got smart loads, even down to a domestic level that are, that are able to communicate and respond um, to, to grid signals and things like that. Um, and then we do do a lot in this sort of call it demand side management space. So demand response, um, just energy efficiency type programs, and then also a uh, bit in the process optimization space as well, so that we are running um, industrial processes in a more energy efficient type manner. Um, so I'll jump into specifically the types of projects that we're actually in, involved in, and then some of the challenges that we're facing in those, which will lead us to sort of where we see the, the Opel RT suite of solutions fit. Um, so I mentioned some large scale behind the meter type projects. So we were providing the control and monitoring and energy management systems for SA Waters Zero Cost Energy Future Program uh, in South Australia. Um, so that's a large program of behind the meter, um, solar, battery, um, and also bringing some um, synchronous generators parallel to the grid as well uh, across 34 sites. Um, so quite a large role. As I mentioned, there's 154 megawatts in total, but some of those sites are 30 megawatts plus. Um, so like I say, providing the power management system and also uh, elements of the energy management functionality um, fell, fell under our remit. Um, if in terms of remote power grids, so we've, we've got a project up at Daly River, which is a remote community in the Northern Territory. It's a completely islanded um, grid um, run originally off of diesel. And over time, they added solar to it uh, to reduce diesel consumption. And there is now actually a grid forming um, battery up there, um, which gives us the ability to run that site diesel off uh, for periods of, of the day. So sometimes up to seven or eight hours during the day, we can actually run in uh, diesel off mode with a combination of battery and solar. Um, we also get involved in projects like um, Snowy Hydro's diesel peaking station up at Anguston, 50 megawatts. So the uh, control systems communication in, um, back to Kuma, remote dispatch and AMO interfacing for all of those is sort of what, we, what we're doing there. Um, we were involved in the site control design uh, for the Calbarry microgrid in Western Australia. So this microgrid is quite interesting in that it's on the end of a really long radial feeder. Um, it's providing grid support, but it's also capable of creating, uh, detecting grid fault and islanding rapidly uh, and restarting the community of Calbarry, um, where there's a local wind farm and some solar and things like that. Um, uh, central powerhouse in the AP Wildlands, is very similar to Daly River. It's a diesel powered remote community. And we're adding uh, at the moment, there's a, a new battery system and some solar going in there again with the target of reducing the diesel consumption. And also stuff like there on the right, Roy Hill power station. So I just wanted to give you kind of a flavor of the type of projects that we end up delivering control systems um, for so that it's sort of setting the context of, of where we're going with the with the Opel RT. Um, so what are, what are the challenges with all of this um, from our perspective? So as, as we're doing more and more of this work, um, what we're finding is compliance with grid code um, is starting to fall sort of in our responsibility. There's there can be ambiguities on these sites as to who's responsible for, um, you know, compliance with grid code. When you look at the context of we're providing the overall site control system and underneath that, you've got multiple DORs and controllable loads and things like that, 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 that we're um, uh, providing dispatch commands for and things like that. Um, and what we find is a big problem is a lot of the times the modeling that we're talking about here isn't done up front in these projects. And what you're left with is working on a remote site um, where the commissioning period is taking an extended period of time to get the plant tuned correctly and compliant with grid code where um, having done the modeling up front probably would have saved a heck of a lot of that time and, and uh, ambiguity that we, that we see on that. 
Um, the other issue that we have is because we're coming from being a control system integrated, not everybody in our business, in fact, very few in our business are actually power systems engineers. So we really need a way of reskilling those guys and understanding how these systems work so that, um, you know, to Sorrell's point, that we're writing better code, that we're structuring our control algorithms in, in the correct way to be um, compliant. So um, this has kind of pushed us to um, look at how we can do things better. How do, how do we um, integrate modeling um, into the system design upfront, which would be the ideal um, way of doing things, but at least in the fat testing uh, and pre-sat testing type um, area of how do we how do we approach the testing of our systems in, in a better way um, to do that? Um, and how do, how do we ensure that we're going to be able to comply with Greek code well before the, the plant is ever designed and, and commissioned? Um, and also then provide, provide a means of training and, and maintenance, um, uh, maintenance and operations training for people as well. Um, so what we've elected to do in order to achieve that outcome is we've only recently just invested in an Opel Ortida, the 4510 unit to do what we're aiming to do is control hardware in the loop type testing. So the objective would be is to have the microgrid itself, inverters, um, uh, the distribution infrastructure transformers and so on, all modeled um, within the Opel RT device and then have our controller under test uh, run against those and, and check our control algorithms and all of that sort of stuff. Um, so that's what we've elected to do. Um, so what, what we're planning to do, and we've kind of put this table here together of where we're at currently um, on the left-hand side. Um, so with our systems at the moment, we're really relying on the power flow studies and, and fault studies of, of the um, microgrids that we're working with um, to uh, sort of do our calculations and our, for our control loops and things like that. Um, and obviously that's an imperfect way of doing things and doesn't take into account the dynamic nature of what it is that we're working with. So what we're aiming to achieve out of the Opel RT device is to get um, that more high fidelity dynamic type simulation so that we can have a higher degree of uh, sort of uh, reliance that we do have a, a, a good set of code that's gonna pass the tests um, from a generator point of view. Um, so this is sort of the ideal um, development cycle that we're going to try and aim for in future by integrating um, the Opel RT device into our um, workflow. So uh, from the very start uh, at the requirements phase, as soon as we get into concept design that we can start using um, some model-based design concepts to really optimize the way we design our control systems and also the way we optimize um, them in future and then use that right the way through um, to final fat testing and, and site testing for support. Um, so what, what are we hoping to get out of it? Um, we see the simulation platform being a really um, great way for us to evaluate, particularly new control platforms um, and things like that that come along that we can have, as I say, a high degree of confidence that we have a system that's going to operate and work correctly. So we're talking about new technologies and systems, new microgrid controllers and things like that. Um, new inverter bases, there's been a lot of talk about grid forming converters and things like that. Um, we end up supplying some of that kit on, on our projects. So being able to uh, emulate and test those kinds of devices is going to be really important for us. Um, and then also be able to optimize the way we operate plants. So a lot of that is comes down to how we um, optimize plant from an economic point of view. So we're taking into account what the energy markets are doing, um, but also to make sure that anything that we're doing from a market participation point of view doesn't actually cause a disturbance or anything like that on the grid as well. Um, uh, uh, so this is sort of a layout of, of um, the different uh, methods of simulation. But like I say, what we're starting with at the moment is um, having just simple controller in the loop. So I'll show you some uh, images in a second. Um, so like I said, we're partnering with the University of Adelaide to develop this um, training rig and test bed for us at the moment. Um, so the way we're going to set this up is we've got the 4510 unit, 
Um, and then we've got our controller under test um, that we're going to run against uh, the, the plant models that we've, we're going to be developing for the microgrids. Um, so we're going to use that as a training platform. So I mentioned earlier on that we've got the Skills Lab business. It's a registered training organization. Um, they've got a diploma of applied technology. So we're going to use this technology to contextualize that training course to be able to provide um, some of that knowledge and capability um, for both ourselves and also to be able to, to train a market. Um, so the components that we're going to have, so we're going to have the microgrid controller itself um, as a physical hardware uh, device that's connected in the loop, and then all of the other controllable loads, inverters, uh, and everything else are going to be simulated in the RT lab uh, type environment. Um, what we're aiming to do with this then is to be able to run tests where we uh, test the various scenarios that we've got um, within the microgrid. So um, the response of the microgrid to fault scenarios on the grid or within the microgrid itself, um, the optimization, the checking for harmonics, all of that sort of stuff, uh, testing all the loop controls, loop tuning, um, the synchronization tests, all of that sort of stuff. Uh, low voltage fault write through um, testing. Um, and uh, how groups of interconnected DORs are going to perform against each other and um, you know, checking that our drip control uh, and load sharing has, has worked functioned correctly. Um, and then also critically testing the transitions between grid connected mode uh, and islanded mode and then resynchronization back again, that, that we see that running smoothly and we're able to test all of that in an offline condition. Um, so what this the, here's the learning outcomes that we've got. That's actually an image of the rig as it's arrived. And Willa there is working on a, a Simulink project for us at the moment. Um, so what we're trying to do is we, we want to really adopt the industry standard tools. So we heard earlier that AMO is using this technology uh, from a system integrator's point of view. We're hoping to use the same kind of simulation platform so that our generation testing can sort of integrate with the larger grid models as well when we go to integrate uh, microgrids on the larger grid. Um, we want to have some kind of uh, training established, training course established out of doing this, um, simulate all the responses of the microgrid, um, a lot of anal analytics, but uh, we also develop optimization software so we can run optimization algorithms against the real-time model as well to check the results of those. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's, that's really what we're trying to do with, uh, with, with the Opal RT, um, type system. That's me, Chris. Thank you, Paul. It was great. It's great. I'm looking forward to seeing the projects you guys going to work on in the next uh, few months with the OP 4510. Uh, we have a question from Stuart. Uh, so I'll ask that right now. Uh, of course, for Paul, in the previous application you mentioned, which I guess were performed without the Apollo RT simulator uh, step, uh, we were, uh, what were the pain points that led to you making the decision to go down on the real-time simulator path for the current and the future projects? Um, yeah, so some of the previous projects, I, th I kind of mentioned it quite briefly, but um, a number of the, particularly the remote community projects, we've got guys remote on site um, and you can have significant delays um, due to the system not performing the way you were expecting it to perform and having to rewrite code. And in some cases, damage equipment where it has to be reordered and brought back to site and things like that. Um, so that, that was one of the issues, but also this um, sort of, you know, the adoption of inverter-based technologies and things like that um, means that there's a lot of new technologies that we really need to learn and understand. Um, so we, we, we've got a, quite a small team who do the power system side of things, but we want to try and grow and develop that. And we really saw the Opal RT uh, unit as a really good means of doing that. And then finally, um, developing new control uh, technologies as well was another area that we was kind of driving us towards it. But we did see because of the experiences with those remote communities that there's a real 
um, gap there where the modeling isn't always done as well as it possibly could be. And it's not always clear who's even responsible to complete the full site modeling, especially when you consider a site with multiple um, actual DORs located at it. Um, and so we decided that that was something that we wanted to investigate further and have in-house. Perfect, thank you, Paul. Uh, there's other question, but we'll uh, keep it for the audience Q&A. Uh, so our next presenter is none other than Felipe Arenio Vergas. Uh, Felipe will talk about this experience that is work at Opal RT Technologies. Uh, Felipe did an eight-month internship at Apollo RT Technologies during a very interesting time that he will mention. Uh, he's, he's currently doing a PhD at UNSW, and uh, yeah, he's also the Australian ambassador for Apollo RT, who helps us around the presentation and webinars and so on and so forth. So, Felipe, take it away, my friend. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, well, in this presentation, I'll be covering, as Chris mentioned, different aspects of OpalRT as a company, ranging from collaborations to real-time solutions. In the first part, I'll share with you my experience as PhD student when collaborating uh, with Opal and specifically during the pandemic. Then I'll give you some insights regarding the integration of user-defined models or black boxes in Hyperseam, which is one of OpalRT's real-time simulator platforms, uh, to finally show you a demo of how this integration uh, looks like. So all started uh, last year in the middle of my PhD studies when my supervisor and I received a call from OpalRT members proposing us to work on developing a model similar to the Australian national electricity market, the NEM. Uh, the enrichment included an internship of two months at OpalRT's headquarters in Montreal, Canada. And even though we had just a couple of days uh, to decide and define how to proceed, uh, we gave it a go and decided to collaborate with them. Uh, but why? Uh, first, uh, my PhD is related to the modeling in real-time simulators of power systems uh, with similar topological characteristics uh, to the Australian name. So it was a good opportunity to work along with one of the main developers of real-time simulators in doing something that both parties uh, were interested in. Uh, second, I've always uh, thought that what is done in academia should be closely linked uh, to the industry or what you are researching should have real application, applications. So what better opportunity than, than this one? Uh, before flying to Canada, uh, we put together a plan. As I mentioned, the main idea was to develop a model of the largest Australian power system. As you have seen in previous presentation, the system looks like this. And the model should be developed for Opal RT's HyperSim EMT simulator, and it should maintain the main characteristics of the real system while removing or not revealing any sensitive and confidential information. In other words, the idea was to develop a synthetic grid of the NEM. So with a defined plan and after two weeks from the first call, I was flying from Australia to Canada. And after being up in the air for around 20 hours, I arrived to the airport in Montreal. Even though up there was quite cold, I was warmly welcomed by everyone at Topal RT. I started working right away on the model while using, improving, and developing Opal RT solutions. At the same time, I was enjoying and learning about the Canadian culture, as well as experiencing a quite different weather uh, to the one in Sydney. Uh, sadly, after some weeks uh, there, the pandemic struck, uh, and I couldn't come back to Australia. At that time, the only chance I had was to fly to Chile, my home country. So regardless of all the difficulties or maybe because of them, I continue working on the project. And after a couple of months uh, with several lessons learned and more experience in real modeling 
uh, real-time modeling and simulation. Uh, we started testing the model and start publishing the outcomes. Um, part of the work was presented during the last Opal RT conference, RT20. Uh, furthermore, we presented the work at the Australian Industrial Conference, Econ 2020. And we are also planning to publish and present an expanded version of the work at the IEEE Innovative Smart Grid Technologies uh, Conference uh, to be held at Brisbane and virtually. Uh, we are planning to make the model available to public after uh, this uh, conference, the IEEE conference, uh, but I leave you the link here, so stay tuned because you will be able to download the, the system as, and start playing with it. Uh, while in Chile, uh, OpalRT was having several projects, uh, so I was offered to work as a part-time modeling specialist, and I thought it was a great opportunity to continue learning and developing my technical uh, teamwork and soft skills uh, when working at a cutting-edge company. Uh, furthermore, all the work was related to my PhD, uh, so I accepted. Uh, as a modeling specialist, at Opal, I had the chance to work in important projects and contribute to them. Some of my main duties were to develop uh, new components and features and work with clients uh, to provide advanced support on power system modeling, uh, real-time simulation, and hardware integration. Um, after several months, I was able to come back to Australia. Down here, uh, I continued working for a couple of weeks up to the end of my part-time contract. At uh, that moment, I decided to dedicate most of my time to finish my PhD. Nonetheless, I continue doing things with uh, OpalRT as a student ambassador. In this role, I provide as much support uh, as possible while promoting OpalRT solutions. Well, now if we move to the more technical part of the presentation, I'd like to introduce you how OpalRT's HyperSIM uh, can integrate user-defined models uh, to the simulation. Uh, to achieve this integration of black models, uh, black boxes model in a dynamic link library or DLLs, we use Orchestra, which is a framework, framework that defines the data communication layer between co-simulation components. Uh, Orchestra also allows you to integrate multiple simulation domains, uh, which may have different programming languages, as well as multiple user-defined models. Uh, the environment consists of the framework and external components that are called uh, the clients. For the particular case of HyperSIM, this framework looks like uh, this figure. Uh, HyperSIM contains the orchestra framework, which allows the communication exchange uh, to external models, for instance, from DLL, MATLAB Simulink models, or any other block that you may have. In particular, HyperSync file contains the IO interface uh, configuration, which contains the framework, uh, the necessary links, uh, be, uh, to allow the communication between HyperSIM and the clients. And HyperSIM may or not have a functional model of a power system uh, network. Uh, clients, on the other hand, are external components uh, that contain a specific uh, model that connects to the framework to exchange data. This could be an inverter model, for example. And when reading from the framework, we say, it publishes, and when it sends data to the framework, we say it's subscribed. Um, so to allow the communication from HyperSync to the client, uh, we use target analog inputs, these boxes here, uh, which publish the signals from the power system uh, model to the DLL. On the other hand, uh, to allow the communication from the client uh, to HyperSIM, analog in blocks uh, can be used. And these blocks receive the signal from the DLL uh, and then are integrated to HyperSIM. 
So to show you how does a uh, real implementation looks like, I'll play a recorded video while explaining uh, to you some of the main aspects of, of it. In, in this model, we have a solar plant that connects uh, to a power system through a transmission line. We have uh, some impedances here and there to represent different short circuit ratios and XR ratios of, of, the, of the system. And we also contain, uh, have some blocks that measure uh, power system quantities that we are going to monitor later. If we go inside the, the power system block, we have the PV plant, the DC link, uh, a two level uh, inverter, which uh, receives six uh, fire impulses signals coming from the DLL. And the rest of the system also has a couple of breakers, some filters, and scaling transformer to represent different power uh, ratings of the plant, as well as other power system uh, components. The model also contains some control blocks to allow different uh, operations of the plant, uh, different uh, set points too. But most importantly, it has a DLL block, which is the main component that operates uh, the breakers in the system, as well as the inverter. It receives uh, voltages and current from the network and provide those signals I previously mentioned. If we go inside this block, we have on the left hand all the analog blocks that are interfacing the power system model DLL. So in this case, each output of this block is linked uh, to the DLL. And on the right hand, we have the block which received the signals from the DLL and there are used as input to the power system model. In this example, we have more than 30 signals uh, coming from the DLL, are all of them are using the power system model. Um, all this is configured in the IO interface. Uh, you may be familiar with this. Uh, we have the orchestra framework with, where we add the inverter DLL. We define the data uh, define file, which contain the list of uh, signals, as well as the external executable, which also receive a configuration file. If we have a look, uh, a detailed look to these files, the data definition file contains, as I mentioned, the list of all the inputs and output signals of the DLL. And, and if we now open the configuration file, it contains some specific parameters, such as the time step of uh, the DLL, as well as some additional parameters that it receives and are not changed during the simulation. Uh, the DLL, on the other hand, just looks as a DLL file, which we cannot open because it's a, just a black box. Uh, with this in mind, we are able now to simulate uh, the power system. In particular, I will show you how the system behaves to a three-phase fault at the point of connection, which is being modeled uh, using a, a breaker. These windows that pop up when starting the simulation represent uh, the executable of the DLL. And now if we, go, if we go to scope view, we will be able to see how the system behaves first uh, during steady state conditions. In this figure, I have uh, instantaneous voltage waveforms and currents, active and reactive power uh, at the point of, of connection we can see the stable operation of, of this system. Uh, we can also have a look at inverter currents, voltages, uh, the duty cycles, uh, and the switching frequency of the inverter, which is variable in this example. And we can also have a closer look to the uh, fire impulses of the inverter. So here I'm just zooming in some of the figures and how you can see those. Um, now, if we want to apply the fault, 
uh, we will see how the inverter or the system behaves. If you remember, it was a three-phase fault. Uh, we see how the voltage drops and how the inverter uh, faults right through the uh, this fault. Again, we have uh, inverter currents, voltages, duty cycles, and the switching frequency, which in this case is block. When the fault is detected, this is because how the DLL is programmed to do so. And finally, we have uh, the firing pulses uh, again of in this uh, situation. Some remarks that I, I would like to highlight here for this model is that, well, it is a very simplified model, but uh, it's already running in multi-rate. So what I mean here is that every power system component and control blocks in HyperSIM is being executed at 50 microseconds, while the DLL is being executed at its default time step. In this case, is around 16.7 microseconds. Uh, we have also tested more complex systems, uh, which uses between five to six cores uh, with more than nine DLLs in it and all doing uh, multi-rate and in real time. So uh, to close with this presentation, I just want to mention that if you want to discuss any ideas or know more about OpalRT, uh, reach out to me or, or any Opalian. Uh, furthermore, I'd like to encourage all the students out there to connect as you may have several opportunities uh, to collaborate and learn with OpalRT. Uh, so yeah, with these final words, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them and continue discussing with you after the session. Thank you. Great presentation, Felipe. Uh, love to see all the hard work you put into. I know how much you worked hard on these projects. And I'm happy that you're back in Australia. It's uh, it's been a long journey, but we're happy that you're safe and sound in Australia. Yeah, uh, I have a, a question from the audience. I think it's Lazis, so I'm gonna allow him to talk, guys. St uh, stay in here. We're almost done. We just have five more minutes, and we'll uh, move into the uh, network launch. So thanks for your patience. So Lazis, go ahead. You're able you're able to unmute yourself and talk. Go ahead, Lazis. Okay. Oh. Okay, I guess uh, I guess it's not where I guess you decide not to ask questions. It's good. So we will move <laughs> on to the next presentation. Uh we'll go directly to uh Deepak. So Deepak is our uh, uh, regional sales manager for Raymac. Uh, he will talk about more the partnership between OpalRT and Raymac. Uh, Deepak has over 30 years of experience in sales and marketing management with full PL uh, responsibility and team leadership skills. So he has a bachelor's degrees and master's from UNSW in electrical engineering. So go ahead, Deepak, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. I'll just get my presentation share. Okay, thanks, Chris. Uh, thanks for giving us the opportunity to present uh, at the RT21. Um, as uh, Chris mentioned, uh, I represent BrainMac, and uh, BrainMac is uh, the authorized distributor for OpalRT products in ANZ. So I won't take a lot of your time. I know that uh, we're probably running a little bit over time. So I will go through uh, just a few slides, just the introduction about BrainMac and how BrainMac can be of assistance to you in ANZ for any of your OpalRT requirements. So um, BrainMac was appointed the distributor for OpalRT products for the ANZ market in March uh, this year, in 2021. Um, and since then, uh, in April, we were also appointed the distributor in the Philippines region. So we've been working very closely with uh, Chris uh, during this time uh, in the pandemic. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to meet uh, face to face, but uh, we do do a lot of calls together with Chris 
and uh, also with our customers or potential customers in the ANZ region. Um, a little bit about Brimac. Um, I was actually watching the uh, introductory comments by the Opalati CEO last night. Um, and it appears that, you know, uh, Brimac and Opalati have very similar, uh, you know, upping. Uh, both are between, you know, 20 to 30 year old companies. Both started off with two partners uh, having a passion and a dream. Um, started off with five staff at that stage. And over the years, you know, now both are global companies with staff well over 200. So it just gave me, you know, a feeling that Opalati and Braymac are very similar companies. And I, I suppose we also have a very similar culture in a sense that the owners of the companies are still very much involved uh, with the day-to-day -day running of the company. And, and it creates that uh, family type environment, even though we're, uh, you know, global companies now. Uh, so Brainec, uh, we were born in 1984. We have over 200 employees worldwide. Uh, our head office is in Sydney and our annual revenues, uh, a little bit over $200 million uh, USD. Uh, we do uh, have uh, uh, presence in a lot of the uh, countries outside of Australia as well. Uh, Australia being the head office, we have a bulk of our uh, staff and also our support staff based in, in Australia. However, uh, we also have presence in West UK and most of the major uh, countries in the Asia-Pac region uh, in uh, China, Vietnam, Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand and Philippines is nowadays a global company. Um, so what, what, what is Brainmake uh, known for? We started off as a humble uh, component distribution company with five staff uh, based out of Sydney. At that stage, the company did not have any authorized uh, franchises. Uh, we were more like a, a trading house, uh, helping customers to source components which were difficult to source at that stage. But over time, uh, Brainmac has uh, developed or wealth into a major uh, local uh, distribution company. But that led to other things within the as well. So from a humble distribution companies, a company we have developed uh, to uh, providing a complete solution to our customers as well. We do like to manufacture and we are also able to uh, provide technology solutions. So we source uh, solutions from all around the world. Uh, if there's a particular requirements from our customer, we can source a, a solution for them. We can bring in local uh, SI partners. We have a lot of system integration partners that we have partnerships with that we can bring into any, any solution for our customers. So we are a lot more than uh, just a component distribution company. Um, I reside within the uh, test and measurement group within BrainMac. So within BrainMac, we have different groups. But the test and measurement group is where um, uh, I, I reside. And in fact, within this group, we have three key suppliers as of today. Uh, a lot of you probably have already heard of National Instruments or NI. Uh, we do the automated test and autom automated measurement equipment. So BIMEC has been a distributor of NI since uh, about mid-2019. And that's where our relationship with Opalati started as well, because it's a national, uh, it's a natural progression from a test and measurement to a, uh, you know, real type simulation uh, environment as well. So that's when our discussion started with uh, Opalati, and we were very honored to be appointed their exclusive distributor uh, in ANZ in March of this year. And part of another product that we have just recently started. Uh, being the distributor in ANZ is Cadence. Uh, Cadence offers computational software entities products. So more towards PCB design or any type of design that needs uh, uh, the uh, you know, computational software. So it's a, it's a fairly new uh, uh, supplier for us, but we, uh, we are working with them as well. So the three key, play, uh, key pillars within our test and measurement is the uh, instruments, Opal RT, and, and Cadence software products. Um, a little bit about uh, the test and measurement in BrainMax. So 
uh, we are head of uh, we are headquartered in Sydney. Uh, I'm the regional sales manager, but besides that, we have other staff uh, that are specialists in in this area. And uh, maybe some of you have already worked with this staff. So uh, you know, Raja Pillay, uh, he's uh, a new South, he looks after the New South Wales academic customers as well as our customers in Queensland market. Uh, Nicholas Sala, he looks after uh, the industrial customers in New South Wales, as well as in Western Australia. Uh, David Orr is a, a specialist in the defense and aerospace area. He talks and works with a lot of the customers uh, uh, yeah, uh, around Australia in the defense area. Uh, a lot of customers are focused in the South Australian Adelaide area. And Rose Bay is our technical application engineer within that group. Uh, in the Melbourne office, we have uh, Gerald Matteo. He looks after our Victorian and South Australian customers. And in, in uh, New Zealand, in Auckland, we have Stuart Little. He looks after New Zealand and the Tasmanian customers at the moment as well. So he's been uh, working very closely with uh, our customers for Opalati products as well. Um, and in the ASEAN countries, we have uh, Shampunat and she looks after our Thailand customers, and Lawrence looks after our Philippines customers uh, in, in that area. Uh, very quickly, just uh, going through some of the areas that uh, my team in the test and measurement has been working, uh, has uh, had successes as well. So we, we work from all the way from academic and research areas to aerospace and defense. We have customers that we are working together with the healthcare industry. And, uh, you know, uh, very true to where we are focusing with Opalati products in the power and energy customers. Uh, we work with electronics manufacturers in Australia as well, and in some of the large industrial uh, applications as well, so like transportation, mining, um, and, you know, other, other large industrial applications as well. So I think that's a, a brief introduction of uh, Braymac. And if... Uh, if uh, any of uh, the attendees would like to discuss uh, about Opalati products further uh, during the networking session or afterwards, feel free to get in touch with us. Uh, we are more than happy to work with you, talk to you, look for solutions for you. Um, and as usual, uh, we do bring um, Chris from Opalati together in the discussion so that we can offer you the best, uh, best solution possible. So thanks, Chris. Thank you so much, Deepak, uh, and uh, uh, it's great to have such a, such a full staff uh, aligned with your team, so I'm looking forward to working with them. You're welcome. Thank you. Perfect. So uh, finally, quickly, I'm going to just conclude here. Uh, on my side, I would like to just show some of the highlight projects that we are working on in Australia. So, of course, we have the ongoing connection simulation tool project with AEMO. Uh, this is a, a well-known. AEMO has released several uh, articles on this. Uh, we're continuing to working on them. We're about to deliver the entire system. If you missed the presentation this morning from uh, Jean, Etienne, and Alistair, go, go check them out. They're recorded. They're very, uh, uh, very interesting, and they give a lot of information about the project. Uh, the other thing that I've been noticing uh, this year specifically is the uh, implementation of and uh, the focus increase on implementing PHL into real-time simulation. So a lot of universities are really taking this approach, so like Monash Third, uh, UNSW, and other universities are really taking this uh, approach to really implement real power hardware in the loops uh, equipment into the uh, studies and into the labs. So this is quite something interesting that we're noticing in, in Australia. Uh, another interesting subject, uh, it's quite a uh, uh, quite new in, in, in the state and a lot of, a lot of uh, great customers are coming out of this is the electric vehicle solution that we op offer. So the entire simulation of an electric vehicle going from a powertrain charging station, battery management system, it's quite coming uh, as, a, as a full uh, integrated solution. And one great thing is that we offer this type of solution integrated with other third-party hardware and software. And one of it is Comemzo, which allows you to simulate, emulate the batteries. Uh, we, all, of course, have uh, our real-time simulators, but we also work with the NI uh, PXI is very stand to simulate some of the power electronics of the inverters of the battery, for example. So this is, I feel like this is where Australia is heading with all the electric vehicle to the grid type of studies that we're going to be doing. So this is quite exciting, and I, I see a lot of potential in this in the upcoming months.
one thing that I want to address is that Issa Felipe did an internship in Australia. So, uh, so we are looking for talent. We have a lot of great projects in Australia, specifically in this type of studies and power system and grid. So we're looking for people to join our team. And uh, we have Maria on the call and Maria also going to be available in the booth uh, for the next two, three hours. You can go and talk to her in the RT uh, booth, RTV fair uh, booth that you have for the HR. And she will be happy to answer your question. So we're trying to also recruit people in the R&D team uh, for internships and so on. So feel free to go apply in this link below or go talk to Maria or me on LinkedIn, anything you want. So uh, it would be great to have the, um, the great pool of talent that comes out of these great universities uh, from Australia. Uh, so uh, again, I want to take this chance to thank uh, all the great presenters that took their time and, and gave almost two hours of their time to this presentation. Without you, this won't be happening. So special thanks to all of you guys. I really love working with you and looking forward to working with you.